Welcome back to the third class of the Investing Masterclass. In this video, I will teach you how to find great stocks. It will be very important because now we have understood why you have to invest for your future and reach financial freedom. And now I will give you the tools, what you have to look to select your investment in order later to build a strong portfolio that will make you rich in the long term. But you need the tools, you need to understand the financial metrics so that you can create a strong portfolio with strong companies and companies that are run with competent management. Here is what we're going to cover in this video. We will see how to generate stock ideas and build a successful watch list. But before we do that, we will see the key criteria for selecting individual stocks. And we will go through everything you need to know, the things that are important, the other metrics that are not important, so that you can build a successful watch list. You will also learn the common mistakes to avoid when picking stocks. That can be mistakes about financial ratios. For example, a company can have strong financial ratios, but the business can be bad. So there is a mismatch between the information you see and the reality, and you have to know this kind of mistake. And you have another kind of mistake, much more psychological, that you have to know, have to be aware of, because as I said in the previous video, investing is 20% brain, 80% temperament. So there will be plenty of traps that you have to avoid along the way. We will also see what makes stocks go up over time. There are key metrics, certain metrics, financial metrics that you can monitor over time. And if these metrics go up over 20 years, your stock is almost certain to go up over 20 years. You have to monitor these key metrics and I will teach you how to do it, which metrics to look at, etc., etc. We will also go through the basic valuation tools to find deals. When you have understood everything about a business, understood the key financial metrics, you have to put a price on it. You have to do a proper valuation and I will teach you the tools how to do it in order to understand if a stock is cheap, if it's a deal and it's in buying territory or if it's expensive and you just have to wait and not buy an expensive stock. I will also teach you the most important competitive advantages. In the stock market, there are thousands of businesses and there are many industries. In each industry, you can have several competitive advantages that will allow your business to thrive. If you buy, if you invest in a stock that has competitive advantages, that has a moat, as we say, well, your business is protected against competitors and your business will have higher margins, higher return on investment, and there is a high probability that this will be a good investment for your stock portfolio. So you must understand competitive advantages so you can maybe build a portfolio full of companies that have strong competitive advantages. That's a strategy that you can have, but you have to understand how it works and how we can evolve over time. And finally, we will see the circle of competence. This is really, really important. You have to know what you know and what you don't know. You want to invest in businesses that you can fully understand, and you want to build a portfolio of companies that you fully understand. If you don't understand an investment, if you don't understand a company, an industry, that's how you can make basic mistakes. That's how you can make mistakes and you want to avoid these traps. You have to stay inside your circle of competence. This is easier said than done and I will show you how it works. So as always, I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is also Christophe Noor and follow my accounts on Instagram and TikTok for more exclusive content. There will be more and more exclusive content and I want you to take advantage of it and subscribe to this account. Share the course. This is really important. And if you have some friends or family members that want to build wealth through the stock market, share the course. Share the course. It's really important. 
A bit of warning, this is the most complete video in the entire course that will add so much value to your expertise of the stock market. I'm sure of it. That's why I'm very happy to do this video. It will be the longest video of the entire module. I'm sure of it. So I highly encourage you to watch the entire video. Don't skip, don't fast forward, and you can watch this segment of the entire course. You can watch it twice because this will be where you will get the most value out of this course. Okay, let's start right now. You have a rule in the stock market, a rule of always looking for the best opportunities in a huge pool of opportunities. Because in the stock market, you have thousands of stocks, thousands of businesses. And if you want to build a portfolio with 20 stocks, well, you have to look for the best 20 opportunities that you can see over thousands of investments. And that's why one of the best investors in the world, Peter Lynch, said, searching for companies is like looking for grubs under rocks. If you turn over 10 rocks, you'll likely find one grub. If you turn over 20 rocks, you will find two. The person that turns over the most rocks wins the game. That's really important that you understand that. You will not find the best stocks in one day. If you look at 10 companies, the 10 companies will not be great investment opportunities. If you look at a thousand stocks, well, you increase your chance of finding gold. Basically, that's the point. You have to keep looking again and again and again. And if there are more than 50,000 stocks in your investment universe, well, you can look for hours and hours, hours. It's a long process. And in this video, I will teach you how you can do it so that you can have a simple process that you can follow and find the best investment opportunities. But it's important to have patience. And if you look at thousands of companies, you can build a very, very good portfolio because you will have found the best opportunities over thousands and thousands of opportunities. So that's the game of quantity over quality. That's part of the game and you have to understand this. You will need patience in this stock picking game. The goal with this method is to build a list with great stocks that you know well. You have to understand them, that they are in your circle of competence. You understand the business, okay? The next step is to put a target price to these stocks and you monitor them from a distance. For example, if you have a stock that you like, that you know really well, you understand the company, you understand the competition, you understand the competitive advantages, you put a target price of $100 and the current price in the market is $150, well, it's too expensive. So you don't want to buy at these prices because there, there is some euphoria and it's too expensive. So you monitor it from a distance. And when the stock falls for some reason, go back to this list. And if your thesis is still valid, if the price is within your price target, you buy. The goal is to build a watch list of dozens of companies. And once you have built the watch list, you put a target price for each of them. And when there is a market crash or for another reason or for a temporary problem, you go back to this list and you see, okay, if the business is still good, still in shape, and this is only a temporary problem, okay, but the price dropped, is it at my target price, below my target price? If it's below your target price or at your target price, that's the time to buy. The time to buy is not when the stock is flying high and expensive. You want to buy it at a fair value or cheaply. So sometimes you need a lot of patience because stocks can be overvalued for a long time. So that's why the third point is really important. Write down a target price and wait. And you wait for the good moment. It's like in baseball when you wait for the good moment to strike. And that's exactly the same situation here. You have to be patient. And when the price is right, you buy. So the main points with this strategy is that you have to be patient and you need few bets 
big bets, infrequent bets. You don't want to buy every week the stocks. You don't want to, you don't need investment opportunities every day. You just build your watch list over time. And when there is a stock crash or for any reason, you strike big. You hit the ball very hard and you pounce on opportunities. As Warren Buffett says, opportunities come infrequently. When it rains gold, put out the bucket, not the thimble. You want to be patient? Okay. But the best investors in the world, if you look at them, they are patient for years and years. And they wait for the good opportunities. And when there is a recession like in 2008, they invest all their portfolio because there are deals everywhere. So, but the work has been done before. The watchlist building has been done for years and years before that. For your situation, if you're just starting in the stock market, you don't need to wait a few years. Just start investing small. But for the big opportunities, if you like a good investment, but it's just too expensive, be patient. You will have your opportunity. The stock market can be irrational for many reasons. So if you're patient, that's how you will have the best gains in the stock market. Now, let's see how to pick stocks. To pick stocks, you have to see if this is a good company or not. That's some basic knowledge. You don't want to invest in bad companies. You will get disappointed really fast and you will lose money really fast in order to have the best gains over the long term. The best way to do that and to reach your financial freedom is to invest in great companies with great management. But you need fundamental analysis to evaluate a business. If you don't understand basic accounting or how to analyze financial metrics, you can't do the proper work. You can't say if a business is good or not. So you have to understand the key metrics. In this free course, we will go through the most important metrics you need to know so that you can make good decisions and build a strong watch list. And if you want to go deeper, I encourage you to join the school community where we will do the complete analysis of every metric. For example, the accounting metrics to see hidden value. Sometimes a stock is cheap and you see the cheapness in plain sight, but sometimes you have to dig deeper and it will teach you how to do it. Okay, so let's start talking about financial metrics. When you analyze a stock, there are many variables and it's easy to get lost because you have some specific terms, specific numbers, and sometimes the math can be quite complex. We will take it slowly, calmly, and step by step, you will understand everything, how to analyze a stock. First, when you analyze a company, you have to analyze three things at the very beginning, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement. These three elements will teach you if a business is profitable or not, if it's healthy or not, if it has cash or a lot of debt. And it's really, really important to understand how everything works. Let's start with the balance sheet. The balance sheet shows you what a company owns and owes in a specific time you can look at the company and see the cash level the debt level the assets the liabilities it has several parts it's divided into five elements the current assets the long-term assets the current liabilities the long-term liabilities and separately shareholders equity the balance sheet is based on a simple formula assets equal liabilities plus equity. We will see later how it works, but let's first go through the other statements. The income statements shows you the revenue and expenses of a company. That's where we will find the revenue, the costs, the margins, the tax rate, the net income. So that's all the calculations, all the operations that you have between the revenue at the beginning to the net income at the end. And finally, the cash flow statement shows you the cash that enters and leaves the company. That's the flow of cash. The cash flow statement consists of the following elements cash flow from operating activities, 
so how the business usually operates if it's a business that sells shoes that will be in this part you can also have cash flow from investing activities so outside the core area of a business and the cash flow from financing activities what do they do with cash do they have more debt or do they pay their debt you have three segments inside the cash flow statement three separate segments and with that you can understand how the cash comes into the business and leaves the business okay that's some basic knowledge about these three segments let's dig deeper on how to analyze a balance sheet as i told you a balance sheet shows what a company owns and owes and in the balance sheet you get an overview of three things the assets the liabilities and the equity the shareholders equity the balance sheet is an overview is a snapshot of a company at a certain point in time so now let's see what's inside the balance sheet you have in one part the assets that show you everything the company owns you can have short-term assets or long-term assets short-term assets are also called most of the time current assets these are assets that can be converted into cash within one year and non-current assets long-term assets are assets that are harder to convert into cash that's things that you can't sell very easily to get into liquidity and you have a list of the most liquid assets to the least liquid assets and at the top of this list you have cash and cash equivalents which is logical that's that's pure liquidity that you have in the short term when you want and you can deploy these liquidities into whatever operation you want and if you go deeper into the least liquid assets you have marketable securities financial assets accounts receivable inventory plant property and equipment intangible assets and goodwill the least liquid asset you have is called goodwill the goodwill is the gap when a company makes an acquisition for example of a company for one billion dollars and when they look at their balance sheet of the target acquisition they look at their balance sheet and the total assets of their balance sheet is worth 500 million dollars so between the buying price of 1 billion and what's inside their balance sheet 500 millions well you have a 500 million gap and where do you put it it's not cash it's not brand it's not intangibles it's not inventory it's just the premium you pay when you make an acquisition of another business and the premium you pay it goes into the goodwill category so you can't sell it in the short term to have some cash that's why it's the least liquid asset you can have okay so now let's see the liabilities it shows you how much the company owns there is a distinction between short-term liabilities and long-term liabilities it's symmetrical to the asset side of the balance sheet you have short-term liabilities called also current liabilities and you have long-term liabilities so also called non-current liabilities for the short-term liabilities that's financial obligations that have to be paid within one year short-term debt for example if you have some debt that you have to pay within one year you put it in the short-term liabilities section and if you have some debt that has to be paid in five years in ten years you don't put it in the short-term section you put it in the long-term section so you put it in the non-current liabilities long-term liabilities section you will have other things inside liabilities but for the moment let's just say that the most important thing is debt in the other part of liabilities you have shareholders equity the shareholder equity shows you how much money the owners so the shareholders have invested in the company this is a quick reminder that when you invest in a company you have partial ownership of a company so if you own a stock you are an owner of a company you are a partner to this company 
And the formula to get the shareholders' equities is total assets minus total liabilities. What is remaining is the equity. There are some great ratios to analyze a balance sheet. And if you look at these ratios, you can determine if a balance sheet is healthy or not. You have the interest coverage that shows you how easily a company can pay back the interest on its outstanding debt. We'll go through the formula after. And you have the net debt divided by free cash flow that shows you how many years it would take the company to pay down all its debt when it would use all its available cash flow. We will talk about free cash flow after. Just remember that there are ratios that you can look at to see if a company is healthy. We will go through every metric in more details later. This is an example of a balance sheet from Apple in the latest annual report, so 2023 at the time of this recording. The annual report was finished in September 2023, and you see the distinction between current assets, non-current assets, current liabilities, non-current liabilities, shareholders' equity. This is very clear, this is very clear, and you have a line for the cash at the very top, the line for the market securities, and you can see how it has evolved over one year of operations. You have in the second column the 2022 numbers. So you can compare year over year how the amount of cash has evolved. Let's look at the debt. On current liabilities, you have a line term debt. So that's short-term debt. And you see that the short-term debt has decreased from 11,000 to 9.8 thousand and these numbers are in thousands I believe if I refer to what's at the top of the document all the numbers are in millions oh no they are in millions so you have 11,000 millions debt in the short term that has decreased to 9,800 millions of debt and that's short-term debt. If you want to look at long-term debt, you go to the non-current liabilities section. You have also a term, term debt. And you see in 2022, there was $98,000 million of debt that has decreased year over year, decreased a little bit to 95,000 millions worth of debt. Okay. And the shareholders' equities is, as usual, total assets minus total liabilities. Now, let's understand how the income statement works. An income statement is also called a profit and loss account because it will show you if the company is profitable or not. It shows the company's revenue and expenses over a certain period. It can be over three months or every six months or every 12 months. The income statement provides you with a lot of insights, how much revenue is translated into net income, the efficiency of management, and much more. That's cost management, basic accounting, and you come and you begin from the revenue. So for a company, it all starts with its sales, its revenue. That is the money a company receives from selling its products or services. So it reminds me of YouTube when they ask them how much they make on YouTube and they only focus on revenue. Well, they don't take into account the costs of operations. Well, that's the bigger number, that's the revenue but you have to subtract the cost of goods sold, the COGS. It shows you all the costs a company makes to produce its products or services. For example, if I make wood tables, well, I first have to buy the wood and this is a cost. So if I sell you a table for $100, 
I don't get $100 in my pockets. I have to subtract the cost of buying the wood beforehand that, I don't know, costed me $20. So the cost of goods sold is here $20. And if you subtract the cogs to the revenue, you get the gross profit. The profit of a business makes after subtracting all the costs that are related to manufacturing and selling its products or services. So you have formula, gross profit equal revenue minus COGS. Okay, let's see all the costs now, including the operating expenses or OPEX. That's all the expenses a company makes to run its daily operations. So basically the wage of your employees, the marketing campaign that you pay so that you can run ads, the R&D, research and development inside the company to make better products. Everything that's not COGS, that's not cost of goods sold because that's not raw materials, but that's cost, operating cost. And if you deduct these operating expenses to the gross profit, you get the operating income, which is also called EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. The operating income shows you how much money a company earns from its normal business activities. So that's important and later we will focus on the EBIT, on the EBIT margin. It will be very important and we will see the evolution of operating income over time. After that, you have non-operating income. So that's income and expenses that aren't related to the normal business activities. So you can have a gain or a loss on financial instruments. If a company uses its cash to trade or invest in securities, that lost value, well, they have lost. Uh, the non-operating expenses can also be the gain or loss on foreign currency. If you have operations of your business in other countries and the payments are in another currency, well, the currency can derate, can fluctuate. So you can have a small gain or a small loss on foreign currency. You can also have in these cost category interest expenses. So when you have debt, and you have to pay your debt in five years, the bank tells you to pay interest expenses. Like uh, if you go to the bank right now and ask for a loan, you have a percentage, 3%, 4%. Businesses have the same issue. So this is called interest expense for businesses. And that goes into the non-operating expenses category. And you can have other costs like this. And after all these other costs, you have your income before taxes, which is the operating income minus non-operating income and expenses. It tells you how much profit the company has made before taxes. That's almost at the end of the equation. The tax rate can move, can change year over year, depending on your jurisdiction, depending if you operate in a specific country. If you operate, for example, in Malta, you can have lower tax rate. Some companies take advantage of this and they put their operation in Ireland or Malta. And if you deduct the taxes, you have your net income. The bottom line or net income of an income statement shows you how much money the company has made after subtracting all costs and taxes. The net income is also known as earnings or profits. The net income is, the equation is income before taxes minus taxes. That's the profit. That's how much money you make at the end of the year after subtracting all the costs. Let's take an example. Let's see the income statement of Apple. It shows you the sales over three years, three columns, because they like it. And I think it's clearer to understand their growth like this. So fair enough. You can see at the top of the table, the net sales from products and services. You have the cost of sales for products and services. And if you deduct the cost of sales, the COGS, to the net sales, you have what they call gross margin, which is the equivalent of gross profit. 
After that, you deduct the operating expenses, which are research and development and selling general and administrative costs. And that gives you an operating income at 114,000 for 2023. With that, you deduct all the expenses and you reach after some provisions, a net income of almost 97,000. And at the bottom of the table, you see earnings per share. Basically, you divide your net income by the number of shares that are trading in the stock market, the number of Apple shares available. And the result of it is earnings per share at roughly six. Okay, so you have some stable returns, slightly increasing earnings per share over three years. Now let's talk about how to analyze a cash flow statement. We've talked about the balance sheet and how to have a snapshot and understand the finances of a business. We've talked about the revenue, costs, margins. Now let's talk about cash, cash flow. A cash flow statement shows you how much cash goes in and out of a business over a certain period. The purpose of this statement is to track how much cash is moving through a business. Because you can have a very strong net income, but a very weak cash flow at the end of the year. So that's why you have the distinction between income statement and cash flow statement. You want to invest in companies that generate cash and manage their cash positions well. That's the point of investing in great companies. Also, I forgot to mention that these slides are provided by Compounding Quality. I love their work and I think it's very clear, especially for beginners. So go to their website if you want more slides like this. But for the white and red slides, that's from their website. And I use them because I like them a lot. Let's go back to the cash flow statement. As I said before, the structure of a cash flow statement is based on three parts, the operating activities, investing activities, financing activities. For the cash flow from operating activities, this section shows you all cash the company generated from its normal business activities. That's normal operations. If you have a business that sells tables, most of the cash that the company generates through the sale of tables, it will be in this category operating activities. It shows you all the cash a company earned from selling its normal products and or services. It shows you all the cash a company earned from selling its normal products and or services. The cash flow from operating activities is comparable to net income, but it filters out a few income and expense posts that didn't cause actual cash to enter or exit a company. The main formula is cash flow from operating activities equals net income plus non-cash charges plus or minus changes in working capital. In fact, you can have some costs in the income statement that are not real costs, that not cash related costs. For example, if you pay an employee instead of real money, you pay it with shares of your company, stock options. Well, cash has not moved, but Inside the income statement, that's a cost, that's a salary, that's a wage. But the cash is not really moving. So you have to adjust some numbers in the cash flow statement to really understand how the cash is really moving. After that, you have the cash flow from investing activities, which gives you an overview about the company's investment related income and expenditures. So. The cash flow from investing activity consists of three major parts. The capex, the capital expenditures. If you build a new site, a new building, so that you can have more workers and more operations, that's capital expenditures. That's big projects for your operations most of the time. Another part is mergers and acquisitions. If a company A acquires company B, well, this is in this category, investing activities. And if you buy another company, you pay with some cash. So this will be a minus in this category that will be in the investing activities. The other part in this 
section is marketable securities. So if you have some cash in your balance sheet and you don't know what to do with it, so you invest in stocks with it. So you manage a portfolio of stocks inside a company's balance sheet. Well, the stocks can fluctuate. You can have gains or losses. And this is not at all related to your main operations, to your core operations. If you have a company that sells tables and that has too much cash and they have a stock portfolio, well, if a stock doubles in value, so they have some quick gains, it's not at all related to their main activities of selling tables. So that's why it's not in the operating activities. The main formula is cash flow from investing activities equals sale of marketable securities plus the investment plus divestments minus capex minus mergers and acquisitions minus purchase of marketable securities. Finally, let's talk about the cash flow from financing activities which measures the cash movements between a company and its owners. So the shareholders and its debtors, the bondholders. This section gives you an insight about how the company is financing its business activities. And the main formula is cash flow from financing activities equals debt insurance plus insurance of new stocks minus dividends minus debt repayments minus share buybacks. So in this category, you will know if a company has some debt and repays it, or you will know if a company pays dividend or buys back its shares. For the share buybacks, let's go back to the income statement from Apple. At the bottom of the table, you see over three years that the number of shares decreased. That's because Apple bought back their shares because you can invest in Apple if you think this is a good deal. But also Apple can invest in Apple. They can buy their stock. If this is a good deal for you, this is a good deal for them. If they think the stock is undervalued, they can buy it back. And that's what they do right now. With all these changes in cash levels, cash flows, you have changes in cash balance. You can calculate the total changes in the cash balance. The formula is cash at the end of the year equals cash at the beginning of the year plus cash flow from operating activities plus cash flow from investing activities plus cash flow from financing activities. You take the cash at the beginning of the year, you add the three sections and you have your cash at the end of the year. You have to know that these section can have negative numbers. For example, if in a specific year, Apple pays a huge amount of their debt, they repay their debt. So they pay it with their cash and there is a cash outflow and a big cash outflow. For example, the cash flow from financing activities will be negative in a huge way. So it's not all positive and it's easy to do it. You know, there can be negative numbers and at the end of the year, you can have less cash than you had at the beginning of the year. And now again, let's see an example of cash flow statement for Apple. You see at the very top, some operating activities. You start with your net income and you do some adjustments. For example, the depreciation and amortization, the share-based compensation expense. To explain, the share-based compensation expense is the stock options. Instead of paying their employees with real cash for their salary, they can pay it with stocks, with Apple stocks. So they take shares, they give them to employees. So uh, that's an expense, yes, but that's non-cash. So you do all these adjustments, short-term adjustments, to reveal the real amount of cash that is moving through Apple. And there are some proceeds from maturities of marketable securities, some sales of marketable securities, payments for acquisition, property, plant, and equipment. And with everything, you have the cash generated by investing activities. And you can see if you compare it with other previous years, there is a big change. It's positive now, about 4,000 millions, but in 2022, 
it's negative, minus 22,000 millions, and in 2021, minus 15,000 millions. So there is a change in capital allocation, and if you dig deeper, you can understand why in this category. Now let's go through the third section, the financing activities section. You have some payments of dividends to shareholders. You have the repurchases of common stock. That's what we talked about when you can buy back your own stock to decrease your share count. And they bought back a lot of stocks about 80,000 millions worth of stocks. And after that, they have proceeds from insurance of debt, a small amount, you have a repayment of debt, and you have all the proceeds or repayments of commercial paper. Okay, and at the end, you have cash used in financing activities, which is quite negative, minus 108 thousand millions if you look at the top of the table you have cash cash equivalents and restricted cash beginning balances so at the beginning of the year about twenty five thousand millions and after everything all the operations all the adjustments all the buybacks all the dividends you have thirty one thousand millions so thirty one billion dollars worth of cash so now you have understood the key information that you can have when you look at a balance sheet or when you look at an income statement or a cash flow statement and you can understand how the operations of a business can evolve over time. Now we will go through the main balance sheet ratios. So in a few seconds you can look at these ratios and see if a balance sheet is healthy or not. There are a lot of ratios, but we will focus on the main ones. And I think the most important ones are these ones. Let's start with the working capital. The working capital is a measure of a company's liquidity and short-term financial health. So in the short term, do you have more assets, more liabilities? So you compare the two short-term metrics in the balance sheet, the current assets, and the current liabilities and you see which one is bigger so the formula is current assets minus current liabilities and if your current assets are higher than your current liabilities you are in a safer position you have more cash than short-term debt so you can pay your shorter debt with your cash the current ratio is very similar is the relationship between the current assets and current liabilities with a division. So you divide current assets by current liabilities. If you have a ratio over one, it means that you have higher current assets than current liabilities, and you can weather any short-term negative events. If you have some negative event like a pandemic that will shut down your operation, you can use your short-term cash to pay your short-term debt. You are not in a hurry. Some businesses have very high current ratios. Instead of having one, they have five or six. They have a lot of cash and very low short-term debt. So this is a very comfortable situation. On the contrary, you have businesses that have current ratios lower than one. It means that they have low amount of cash and a fair amount of short-term debt. So that could be a problem. And in a few seconds, you can see if the current ratio is below one or above one. Another ratio is the interest coverage that shows you how well a company can pay the interest due on outstanding debt. So you divide your operating income, your EBIT, by your interest expense. And the higher the ratio, the more comfortable the company is it's much more likely to pay its debt and much more likely to be healthy if this ratio is high. Another ratio that you have is debt to equity. It's a famous ratio. It's used to calculate a company's financial leverage. So you divide your debt by your equity because some companies use a lot of debt to finance their operations. 
and other companies don't use debt at all to finance their operations. But when there is a big problem, the companies that have a lot of debt suffer the most. So you have to know if a company has a lot of debt or not. And you compare the debt level to the equity level to see if this ratio is really high and there is a lot of debt and this could be risky in the future or if it's low and the company is in a safer situation. Finally, you have the asset turnover. It shows you how effectively companies are using their assets to generate sales. You divide your sales by your total assets. For example, if you have $100 worth of assets and you generate $1,000 worth of sales, you are very efficient because you have very low assets, you don't own anything, and you make a lot of money. Uh, for your sales, your revenue, your top line. So that's very good news. And you have a return on investment for your assets that is really high. I think with these balance sheet ratios, you can have a very good amount of information to see if the balance sheet is healthy or not, if they have a lot of cash, if they have a lot of debt, are they able to pay their debt? And it will be very useful later. Now let's talk about profitability ratios and let's first talk about margins. If you remember correctly in the income statement, the first line of the income statement is revenue, sales. The second line is COGS, cost of goods sold. And if you subtract the COGS to the revenue, you have a gross profit. Well, the gross margin ratio that you see here is the company's gross profit compared to its revenue. So you get your gross profit and you divide it by your revenue and you have your gross margin. Linked to this, you also have an EBIT margin, an operating income margin, what percentage of sales remains as profit before tax and interest. So you divide your EBIT by your sales, by your revenue. And at the end of your income statement, you have your net income. You can also have a margin a profit margin, a net profit margin, a net income margin, you divide your net profit by your sales and you have a percentage. This is your margin. When you analyze and you compare two businesses, you can compare their margin profiles. If, for example, you have some luxury goods, Louis Vuitton, LVMH, they will have higher margins than, say, a Costco that have much more cost and the business model is different. Another margin that is important is the free cash flow margin. It shows you what percentage of sales is translated in pure cash for the company. You have the free cash flow divided by sales. And you may ask, what's a free cash flow? Well, let's go back to the statement of cash flows, the cash flow statement, free cash flow is cash flow from operating activities minus capital expenditures or capex. The capex is in the cash flow from investing activities. So you will take your operating cash flow and you subtract the capex. So you have your free cash flow, cash available at the end of the year. The free cash flow is quite important and used a lot to analyze businesses. So the free cash flow margin is free cash flow divided by your sales. Some business generate a lot of cash flow and some business have huge sales, huge revenue, but generate very little cash flow. So that's different business models. And again, it's very useful if you compare two companies. Now you have the return on assets, which is very simple. You divide your net income by your total assets to understand how profitable you are with your assets that you use, it indicates how profitable a business is in relation to its total assets. Some businesses have very little profit, but they have a lot of assets, so it's not very profitable. And some business, on the contrary, are very profitable with very little assets. These asset light businesses have huge return on investment, huge return on assets, and usually they are good investment because they have lower cost, etc. 
this is all linked and this return on assets ratio can be important especially for capital intensive businesses in the same category you have the return on equity you will divide your net income by the shareholders equity and another return is the return on invested capital which is quite important it shows you how efficiently a company is allocating capital so you divide your NOPAT by your total invested capital what's a NOPAT it's EBIT so operating income and you multiply it by one minus tax rate so you have your NOPAT and you divide it by the total invested capital we will see that later but generally it's the assets and the debt that are used to have your business operations a slight difference from the return on invested capital is the return on capital employed the main difference is the formula instead of taking the NOPAT you take the EBIT and instead of having the total invested capital you take long-term debt plus equity you remove the short-term debt or other categories of liabilities also let's talk about earnings per share it's how much money a company makes for each share outstanding i like it a lot when company talk uh, in per share measures at the end of the year you have your net income and as we saw previously you can divide your net income by the total number of shares outstanding and you have your net income per share your earnings per share if you do something and if you change the number of share outstanding it will change your earnings per share metric so you have a relationship between earnings but also your share count and you can manipulate each of them so you have the earnings per share it will be very very important in your future that you understand how it works and finally the last profitability ratio is the free cash flow generation you compare free cash flow and net income you take free cash flow you divide it by net income if you have a ratio of one that means that 100 percent of net income is translated into free cash flow some businesses with adjustment in the cash flow statement when they have 100 dollars of net income they can generate more free cash flow 110 dollars of free cash flow some businesses on the contrary can do less and with this amount of net income they generate less cash flow well you have to understand this because businesses are different and when we will do the idea generation part later we will see how free cash flow can evolve over businesses evolve over time this will be very important and that's it for the profitability ratios and if you think that there are a lot of ratios well there are more and that's important if you want to do the complete analysis of a stock you need many ratios to understand the complete story of an investment thesis you need a lot of ratios to understand the company's financials and we will combine all these ratios later to have a clear direction if this business is a good business or a bad business but we need many ratios to understand and have a full clear picture of a business we have more ratios for you let's continue with the cash flow ratios and let's talk about the most important ones let's first talk about the free cash flow per share it's similar to the earnings per share that we've seen before it's just that instead of talking about earnings we talk about free cash flow so you have your free cash flow and you divide it by the shares outstanding that's your free cash flow per share and as you can see the evolution of your earnings per share EPS over time over 10 years 20 years you can see the evolution of the free cash flow per share over time that's very similar also another ratio is the interest coverage ratio it measures how well a firm can pay the interest due on outstanding debt and you take the cash from operations and you divide it by interest paid so how comfortable are you paying the interest on your debt if you generate a lot of cash 
well, you will be much more likely to pay your debt. And if you don't generate a lot of cash, well, you have a problem. And this ratio shows you if you have a problem or not. Another ratio is the free cash flow margin that we've seen before. You take free cash flow divided by sales. Another ratio that is also important, especially for dividend investors, is the payout ratio. It's the percentage of free cash flow that a firm pays to its shareholders in dividends. So at the end of the year, a company generates free cash flow. What is the amount of this free cash flow that you pay to dividend? So you take the dividend per share and you divide it by free cash flow per share. Or you can also take the whole dividend payment, the dividend that you pay to shareholders, and you divide it by the free cash flow. They added it uh, a per share metric, but you can do it without the per share metric. So for example, if you have free cash flow at the end of the year, if you have a payout ratio of 30%, it means that 30% of all the cash you generated during the year, 30% goes to dividend. So your shareholders will have 30% of the cash you generated. It doesn't mean that as a shareholder of the company, you will have a 30% yield. That's different. It's just that 30% of the cash that the company generates goes to dividends and 70% of the cash that the company generates goes into other activities. Now, an important metric, especially for valuation later, is the free cash flow yield. It's a metric that shows you how cheap or expensive a company is valued in terms of free cash flow. You take the free cash flow per share and you divide it by the stock price. It's how much the free cash flow is compared to the whole company. If the free cash flow yield is 10%, it means that the free cash flow of the company is about 10% of the whole company. And the higher, the better. Finally, you have the free cash flow per share growth, which is only the evolution of free cash flow per share over time. Let's do a quick break to make sure that you have understood everything from the previous slides. We've seen the balance sheet, which is a snapshot of a company at a certain time with assets, liabilities, equity, and it answers the question, is the company healthy? What is the cash level? What is the debt level, etc., etc.? What is inside the company at a certain point in time? We also have the income statement. So in a period of, say, one year, is the company making money? Is it profitable? What are the margins? What are the costs? What are the expenses? And what is the evolution of these margins over time? Because you can see an income statement for this year and you can compare it with the previous year and then the previous year and over three years five years ten years you have the evolution of the margins over time is the business getting more profitable with higher margins over time or is it the opposite and it's getting worse and worse over time it also happens but now we understand how it works margins cost revenue sales net income all the key metrics. And finally, we've seen the cash flow statement. Does the company generate cash? What is the flow of cash? The actual cash that the company uses to finance operations, to have more debt, to reward shareholders with dividends. What do they do with the cash? That's the big takeaways from the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement. Now, if you look at the biggest investors in the world, they look at specific ratios. For example, Warren Buffett selects companies according to certain criteria. He doesn't have a strict plan. It's just that most of the investment that he made over his lifetime, they had similar metrics, similar ratios. So you can take the average of these ratios and have a plan that is similar to Warren Buffett's plan. Here are the ratios. For the income statement, he likes to have gross margins of a business above 40%. For the SGNA margin, you have less than 30%. 
So SGNA are marketing, wages, R&D costs, all this, all this stuff. For the R&D margin, talking about R&D, you have less than 30%. You have other metrics, and I would say that the most important ones are the net income margin that has to be more than 20%. In other words, the business has to be profitable with high margins and the net income margin has to be high and growing over time. That's the best case you can have. The EPS growth, the earnings per share growth over time must be positive. So the company must be making earnings, not losses and growing. You need EPS growth. You need earnings that are growing over time. And as we've seen before with Apple in their income statement, the earnings can be stable, but the share count can decrease. That means in the quick formula that your earnings per share will increase over time. So that could be a way to boost your earnings per share. If your net income is stable over three years, a company can buy back its own shares to boost their EPS growth. That's also a way to manipulate the stock market price of your company, but we will see that later. Uh, ratios about the balance sheet are quite important also. Something that Warren Buffett likes is when a company has a lot of cash and little debt. So cash is above debt. The company is in the comfortable situation of having more cash than debt and is able to pay its debt quite easily. And Warren Buffett likes this situation a lot. Also, he takes the ratio debt to equity and does some adjustment. You take the total liability, you divide it by the shareholder equity plus treasury stocks, and he likes this ratio to be below 0 0.8. That's the kind of adjustments that some big investors do and I would not recommend to do it if you're beginning in the stock market. Don't do adjustment. Just use the pure metrics, pure ratios. It will be much easier. And for the cash flow statement, he looks at the capex margin. So for the capex margin, you take the capex capital expenditure and you divide it by net income he likes to have it below 25%. Now, talking about investment and talking about CapEx, let's talk about capital allocation. Capital allocation is very important. That's the most important task of management. And what is capital allocation? It's the decision about what the company will do with the money it earned. Management should put cash back to work at the most attractive rate of return. It's their moral duty towards shareholders. It's at the end of the year, you have some cash generated by your operations. What do you do with the cash? Do you pay dividends? Do you reinvest all the cash into the business? Do you use your cash to buy a competitor to be bigger? How do you compare all these alternatives? How do you see that? Well, you can do some calculation. You can say, okay, my stock is very expensive, so my stock is not a deal. I will not buy it at the moment. I can see that one of my competitors' stock is cheap. That means I can buy them very cheaply, so that can be an opportunity. But also there are some investment in AI that my company will benefit a lot from. What should I do? Should I buy the competitor or put all my cash to work to have some AI opportunities. Well, that's the job of management. That's capital allocation. You can have several capital allocation options. The first one is organic growth. It's reinvestment into the business. Organic growth is the most preferred capital allocation choice. You want to invest in companies which can reinvest a lot of their earnings in future growth opportunities at attractive rates of return. For example, let's look at Amazon that for 20 years reinvested all their cash into the business again and again and again. So you have a snowball effect over 20 years that is insane. And they were able to do that because there were huge growth opportunities for them. 
At the beginning, they were selling books, then some hardware, then everything. And if you look at the panel of opportunities that Jeff Bezos had at the beginning, you can have return investment at 30% for this, 30% for this, 20% for this, 40% for this. And he looked at opportunities that could generate 30% return investment. And he said, okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's invest back in the business because we can grow 30% per year. And that's what he has done over 20 years. And that has worked wonderfully. So you want a management that can recognize the opportunities inside the business. And if the management is competent, he will see the opportunities and will be able to grow 30% per year for 20 years. That's the most beautiful destination you can have for a business. But not all businesses have reinvestment opportunities of 30%. For example, big major businesses that have consolidated and don't have much competition, they don't have growth opportunities, they don't have opportunities to reinvest their money, they can't do that. Because first, they are too big to grow 30% per year. And two, they don't know what to do. They don't have opportunities. Maybe they have some opportunities that will not generate 30%, that will not generate 20%, not generate 10%, but only 4, 4%. Is it worth it to go and put all your cash into an opportunity for your business that will make you grow 4%? I don't know. Maybe you have other alternatives. And that's the most important way of growing your business. And that's where most of companies use their cash. It's essential that the company has a high and stable ROIC, which is return on invested capital, when it reinvests a lot in organic growth. Why? Because growth only creates value when ROIC is superior to the WAC, the weighted average cost of capital. So that's the typical cost of capital. When you put money into a business, what is your capital costing you? For example, if you have some debt in your business and your interest rate of your debt is 5%, that means that you have to pay to the bank every year. Your capital that you have is costing you 5% every year. Will you go and chase opportunities that will generate 3%? I don't think so. That's not worth it. You have a 5% cost of your money every year, 5%, 5%. You will try to go higher. And if you have opportunities that generate 20% return, return on invested capital of 20%, well, that's much superior to your 5% interest rate on your debt. So you always have to compare your cost of capital and the return investment that you can get through different opportunities. So that's a very complex situation that management is when they have too much cash and they don't see many opportunities. If there is a mistake and over 10 years, all the capital allocation decisions are bad, well, as a shareholder, you will not be happy. So you want to make sure they are good at capital allocation. And I will teach you how you can see if a management is good at capital allocation or not. The second capital allocation option that the management has is to improve the balance sheet. A company can also use the cash it generates to pay down its debt. This is especially an attractive option when the company is in bad financial shape. A healthy balance sheet gives companies flexibility. Consider Bill Gates at Microsoft, who advocated for maintaining sufficient cash reserves to sustain a companies for a full year with zero revenue. You want to play it safe, and if there is a pandemic and the world shuts down, you want to survive. You want to survive, and you want to have enough reserves, enough cash to survive. If you have a lot of debt and you don't generate a lot of cash, if there is a crisis for any reason, if there is a crisis 2008, you don't want a heavy burden. You don't want a lot of debt. So you can use your cash at the end of the year to pay your debt. The third option of capital allocation is M&A, mergers and acquisitions. 
This is risky, but sometimes it works. Research has proven that between 60 and 90% of all acquisitions destroy value. That's why you should always be cautious when a company announces a big acquisition. Large M&A activities only make sense when two criteria are met. Management has skin in the game and the company has proven to be a successful serial acquirer in the past. M&A is very difficult. You can pitch a beautiful deal and they can have beautiful slides. There will be synergies in three years. We will pay all our debt and we will have some margin accretion, some improvement of the margins in three years that will be beautiful. Time over time. These synergies never happened. These improvements of margins never happened because there are some temporary issues, because there are differences in culture. The mindset is different between the two companies. The culture is different. You have some mismatch. And sometimes a big merger creates a big, huge company. And most of the time, these big and huge companies are not much more profitable. It's a burden to be big because you're quite slow. It's much better to be in shape and so you can move fast and cut cost very easily. When you're too big, you are not agile and it's a burden of operations. You have too many people, too many employees. You don't know what to do. That's why most of the M&A activities are very hard to do. And if a management has skin in the game, so that means they are meaningful owners of the business. So for example, if they have all their family fortune in their stock, well, they are incentivized to do well. And if they have done, if a management has done beautiful mergers over 20 years, beautiful acquisitions over 20 years, then you can say, okay, I trust them. They will do more acquisitions. But apart from these two scenarios of skin in the game and a huge, beautiful track record, then it's very risky to do M&A. And as an investor, to believe management, if they are going to do an M&A and they're going to say it will be beautiful with beautiful synergies, beautiful margins, improvements, that's risky. The last option that the management has at the end of the year, what do they do with the cash? They can return capital to shareholders. They can do it with dividends or share buybacks. A company usually returns capital back to shareholders when they don't have any other attractive growth opportunities. Dividends. Always look at the dividend yield and the payout ratio for the company. Key metrics to look at when you invest in a dividend stock. And for share buybacks, it only creates value when the stock is undervalued. I will try to make it clear. We've seen before in Apple's income statement that they bought back a lot of shares. And they did that because they thought that the business was undervalued. Management thought that it was a good deal, that the stock price was attractively priced, and they invested in themselves with the stock buyback. If your stock is not undervalued, if it's fairly valued or overvalued, it can be expensive. Instead of doing the stock buyback, you can pay dividends. If you want to reward shareholders and say, okay, 50% of my capital at the end of the year, uh, I will reward shareholders. Well, instead of going for stock buybacks, you go to dividends and you can be very flexible. One year you go to buybacks, the other year dividends. That's in theory. In theory, you can be very flexible. In reality, all the companies that have a lot of dividends, this is not flexible at all. And once a company pay dividends for five years to their shareholders, well, for the six years, shareholders want their meal. They want their dividend. And if a company say, okay, we will decrease the dividends, we will go to buybacks because our share is so attractive. Well, shareholders will not like this at all. 
and you will have some derating, everybody will sell the stock, so you have some emotional bias around this. But in theory, you have two options when you want to return capital to shareholders, dividends and buybacks. And the job of management is to look at capital allocation options and to compare them as alternatives. Which of these different capital allocation options we generate the most return on invested capital. If you do it through organic growth and you choose to invest in your own business, for example, it can generate 10% return per year if you do this. If you reinvest in your business, you will have 10% return on investment. But if you buy your competitor and you do M&A, maybe it will give you 12% return on investment. Or if your stock is cheap at the moment and it is so cheap that your price earnings ratio, this is a measure for valuation that we will see later, it is so cheap, the ratios are so good that you think if you do that and you invest your cash into stock buybacks, it will generate 15% return on investment. Well, you have all these opportunities with all these alternatives and you have to be right and make good decisions time over time, year after year, decade after decade. That's the most important task of a management and that's why capital allocation is so important when you pick stocks. This is a very difficult job and everything that you will do, every decision that you will make will be discussed and analyzed by some analysts, by your shareholders, and you will be hated if you choose the wrong option. If you do an acquisition that turns out three years from now, it turns out to be really bad and it destroyed value you thought it would increase margins but it turns out to be a really really bad option all the shareholders will hate you for this because they will say don't do stupid acquisitions instead give us some dividends we are very good for that or instead they could say okay just reinvest in your business you were very good doing that in the past why did you change direction that's a very complex job and that's why you have very few good capital allocators over 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. The good thing is that with all this difficulty, if you have found one good capital allocator over 10, 20, 30 years, just stick with him because if he or she is a good capital allocator, you will be handsomely rewarded as a shareholder and you want to invest for the long term with him or her. That's crazy the amount of return that you can have if you just follow good management. And over time, if you think decades instead of thinking month of years, if you think decades, the most important factor that will increase your share price over time, the biggest element is management. If your management has a good vision and the management says, okay, we will reinvest everything in the business, trust us, we will compound at 15% per year with organic growth, we will don't do any dividends, any buybacks, any M&A, we'll just reinvest in the business and we'll have a snowball that will be so huge in 20 years, Just you just have to trust us. If you follow management, that has a good track record at capital allocation, it will generate a lot of very, very good returns. And there are some capital allocation metrics that you can monitor over time to see if a management is a good capital allocator or not. If the cash used is generating a lot of return on investment or not. There are a lot of key metrics to measure the capital allocation decisions of management over time but some of the most important ones are the return on asset, the return on equity, the return on invested capital, and the return on capital employed. If you compare two companies, one with a return on capital employed of 4% and another company with a return on capital employed of 26%, well, you have a big difference between 
how the company is managed. Sometimes it's because of the management, because the management is great and can generate 26% return, doing great things. And sometimes I must say that the industry can be a huge burden to investments. If a company wants to invest in logistics, for example, and they are operating in a capital intensive industry, it will cost them a lot of money with very poor returns. So everything in mind, capital allocation plays a huge role in your evolution of stock price. But even with a very good capital allocator, if the management and the company is in a bad industry, it will be much harder for them to reach good metrics, good return on assets, good return on equity, etc., etc. The difference is between these metrics, I would say that if you compare the return on equity and the return on invested capital, the key difference here is debt. When you look at return on equity, you compare net income and you divide it by equity. When you see return on invested capital, you look at no pat and you divide it by total invested capital. Inside total invested capital, it takes into account debt, whereas equity doesn't take into account debt. So a company with a lot of debt can have a huge return on equity and a okay, a fair return on invested capital. That's why I'm showing you all these different ratios because one ratio, one metric can be biased because of debt, for example, but it can be biased for another thing. And if I'm showing you eight metrics and they all point to the same direction of an amazing business, they all have 20%, 30%, you can have a fair amount of information of, okay, this business is generating 20% return on investment. If you only look at one metric, you can be biased. If you only look at return on equity, you have 30% return on equity. Well, this is all faked because of debt. So that could lead you to a wrong decision and you don't want that in your business. That's why I'm showing you all these metrics, all these ratios. I know there are a lot and you will see more ratios like this. And when all these ratios, all these metrics point to the same conclusion, you can be reassured that it is overall a good business. That's the point of having a lot of ratios and not relying on only one or two ratios. So let's do a quick break also and do some takeaways about capital allocation. The important aspect of capital allocation is to understand how management thinks. Look at the track record. If a management loves dividend and over 20 years, he just, at the end of the year, the management just pays dividend and doesn't reinvest in the business. Okay, you have a fair amount of information. You have the vision of management. They don't see other opportunities in their business. They don't see M&A opportunities or reinvestment opportunities. Maybe they like to be comfortable. Maybe there is just no opportunities and dividends are the best use of their capital. Maybe they are lazy. Maybe they are afraid of competition. Maybe the family of uh, the management members depend on these dividends and they like having a big bonus at the end of the year to pay a yacht. You don't know. You don't know and having a good track record takes care of this. If you look at the track record, you will have all the information you need to evaluate a business. So the big question you can ask is, do they reinvest in the business to have like a snowball effect? Because if you compound inside a business, your reinvestment opportunities at 20% for 20 years, 30 years, I guarantee you that as a shareholder, you will be very happy. Another question is, do they go into M&A and diversify away from their business? That's also a mistake that management can make. They can do an acquisition of a business that is not at all in their area, in their expertise. If you have a business selling ice cream and they do some M&A and they buy a software company, well, the ice cream management may be not capable of developing and scaling a software business. That's not in their expertise. So that's quite risky. And I've seen that many, many times 
where a management can be seduced by an opportunity of uh, an acquisition because the price is too cheap to ignore, you don't know. But once it happens and once you have the acquisition, uh, you get disappointed really fast because you think you will get margin accretion, a lot of synergies between the ice cream business and the software business, but in reality, not at all. So that's a risk of uh, diversifying away from your business. You can do m a inside your core area of your business, and that's risky, I would say, because synergies almost never happen. And that's almost even more risky if you do it outside your core operations. Finally, big dividends or buybacks? That's a good question. At the end of the year, when you have some cash on your balance sheet, you don't know what to do with it and you don't see many big reinvestment opportunities. You don't see big acquisition opportunities. You don't see reinvestment opportunities. You don't have debt to repay. What do you do with your cash? Well, you can return capital to shareholders, but it all depends on valuation. If your stock is trading cheap, it's much more likely that the buybacks will create value. Buybacks are better because as if you were a shareholder, you want to buy when the stock is cheap. Well, these companies can buy back their own shares if they think it's cheap. If the stock is overvalued, you don't want to buy a stock that is overvalued. You don't want to do buybacks when it is overvalued. It may be better to pay big dividends. If a management does the mistake of buying back its own shares when the stock is overvalued, it will destroy value. And we will talk about valuation later in this course, so you will understand why I'm saying this. But valuation plays a huge role when you talk about buybacks. If you want to understand capital allocation and how management has performed in this field, you can look at the past 10 to 15 years of financials and look at key metrics. For example, has the share count increased or decreased over 10 years? When did large changes happen and why? You can do some research and if you do that, you will understand if management did big buybacks when the stock was trading cheaply or expensively. And if management did buybacks only when the stock was trading cheap, well, that's good news. That's what you want. Also, you can look at the cash flow statement for evidence of M&A. As I told you previously, you can see the big acquisitions in the cash flow statement and you can see how much was paid and what was the result. You can see that if you do some research after three years, three years after an acquisition, five years after an acquisition, management will tell if the synergies that were pitched at the beginning, if they happened five years after the acquisition. Did the synergy happen? Did the margins go up? Well, you can see that with the 10 years of track record. You can also compare the return on invested capital, ROIC, over time, over 10 years, 15 years, to see if this metric has increased over time or decreased over time. If your return on invested capital increase over time, that's a very good sign of good capital allocation. And if it has been in a decline, uh, it shows poor capital allocation or difficult business model. Either way, that's not a good sign. And another question that you can ask yourself is, does m and serve strategic goals or does it paper over strategic failures? You want to understand the philosophy, the mindset of management regarding M&A. And if management wants to do M&A because they want to get bigger and bigger, or do they want to try another market, or do they want to try another business line, you can know everything you want because that's public resource. And if you do some research, you can have these information. In future modules in the school community, we will talk about capital allocation and how we can create value over time, like in details. And also we will see the situations where bad capital allocation can destroy value over time. That also happens. And this is an example of the slides we will discuss. And if you have an analyst that asks some question to a management, 
they can ask some good questions to understand the philosophy, the mindset of management. For example, you can ask a management, what is your process? Who is responsible for capital allocation? What is the hurdle rate? Or what has been your biggest error? And management has to be transparent in this field to really reassure shareholders so that they really understand the business. Also, management can use several metrics to measure capital allocation decisions. They can use return on capital employed, return on invested capital. And in your formula of, for example, the return on invested capital, what is included in the denominator? You have total invested capital. But what's inside? Do you remove things from the denominator so that your ratio, your metric is improved? You can cheat and you have to go deep into this analysis to really understand how capital allocation is done. What was the return on investment on past deployments of capital? That's important to see if management is aware of its mistake in the past and how it can improve and improve and improve over time. Also, some good questions to better understand capital allocation is to ask if management has learned things over time. If you do some research and you can have some good information about a bad scenario that happened to the company, uh, if you can have the information, what did you think would happen? What did happen? What did you learn? Should the process change? That's really good news so that you have a complete view of how the management team thinks about capital allocation. But I will not go in details about capital allocation right now. I will do a deep dive on it later in future modules. So let's continue with our class and let's talk about insider ownership. Sometimes it can drive the stock price really high. A CEO that owns a meaningful share of its company will most likely do everything to grow its share price. They are incentivized to boost the stock price in the long term. And that is the case because if most of your wealth depends on the stock price of your company, you want it to go up. That's as simple as this. Sometimes you want it to go up very fast so you can buy a new house. And sometimes you're not in a hurry and you want to grow your share price over the long term. But every time you analyze a company, you want to see if, for example, the CEO owns 10% of the company. You want to know these kind of things. You want to understand insider ownership, how it works. Is the complete family in the board of the company? Do they have a lot of power and a lot of voting rights and they own a significant share in the company? You want to know how insider ownership is in your investment. For example, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Meta, owns about 14% of the company of a company called Meta Platforms. And if the stock price of Meta Platforms drops 50%, Mark Zuckerberg's net worth will be down 50%. So over the long term, I think Mark Zuckerberg wants the stock to go up. Another example is Warren Buffett, CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, that owns about 16% of his company. Well, again, that's a big deal. And I can show you plenty of other examples of smaller companies when management, the CEO owns 30%, even 20% is a big deal. If a CEO owns 20% of his or her baby, baby business, well, that's a big deal. And that will be very meaningful in terms of how you think about the company. Well, that's a proper incentive and I would suggest to only invest in companies where you have a meaningful insider ownership. If the CEO of a company only owns less than 1% of the shares, well, that could be a bad sign, a lack of incentives. You want their interests to be aligned with yours as a shareholder. And if the CEO of a company or the entire management team of a company doesn't own a meaningful share of your company you own, well, that could be a bad sign and they can do whatever they want. They are not incentivized. And if the stock price drops 50%, well, 
they can get fired, but uh, they will not lose 50% of their net worth. And that's even a bigger incentive to do good capital allocation because if they do some buybacks, for example, well, indirectly, they increase their ownership of their business. So buybacks at a gold price are very good for insiders. And we talked about capital allocation and I want to show you how important buybacks are. And if you do them right, you can really create value. Buybacks make you think about per share metrics. So we have seen before the earnings per share, the free cash flow per share, but you also have the revenue per share. You take the revenue and you divide it by the share count. Because if you don't think about per share metrics, you can fall into a trap. Some companies issue shares to raise money in the stock market. When a company issues shares, so when the company creates more shares in the stock market, they increase the share count. So the earnings per share, when you had like net income divided by share count, well, the denominator increases and you have lower earnings per share. It dilutes the current shareholders. You get the smaller slice of the pie. And if a company is growing revenue fast, but also is showing a lot of shares, it means every dollar of revenue is much less meaningful to existing investors because their shares are diluted. And Palantir, which is a software business, is an example. Since 2021, revenue has grown at a 22% CAGR, so compounded annual growth rate, but diluted shares outstanding have grown at a 9% CAGR. So revenue per share has only grown at a 13% CAGR. So increasing the share count will decrease your per share metric. You just, if you have your division, you have your formula, you just increase the denominator. So all the metric, all the revenue per share, earnings per share, free cash flow per share are decreased if you issue more shares. The best situation is improving fundamentals. So revenue up, earnings up, free cash flow up, and you add with that buybacks. And even better than this, you have buybacks at a cheap price. That's better because you have your fundamentals, revenue, earnings, cash flow that goes up, which in your formula is your nominator. And at the same time, you have some buybacks. So share count is decreasing. If you do that, it's as if you kill two birds with one stone and you improve the per share metrics, the per share performance by a lot. And that's a wonderful and that's a wonderful phenomenon if this happens for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Some companies have done this and improved their fundamentals while doing buybacks and the results have been phenomenal. Okay, so we've talked about capital allocation, management, buybacks, incentives to the price to go up. The question you may ask is why stocks go up over time? Well, there are many reasons and many different reasons in the short term and in the long term. In the short term, the factors that cause the markets to go up and down can be quite diverse. You can have the simple supply and demand. If a lot of people like these stock, well, there is a lot of demand, so the price can go up in a short amount of time, but it can fluctuate. You have some market indicators like the GDP numbers of the US that are, I don't know, disappointing for these quarters. So there is a sell off in the stock market. You can have also the confident index if people, households are confident right now regarding the state of the economy, their employment, etc. These public indicators can influence the mood of the stock market. You can have some war and other conflicts. Geopolitical issues will bring more fear to the market. So people are more risk averse and then they can sell some companies that are more risky. You can have some concerns over inflation, government, fiscal policies, technological change, change in weather that will impact the business some other regulation, deregulation, level of stress in the financial sector, level of trust in the legal system. There are a lot of things that can influence prices in the short term. Basically, anything can happen in the stock market. 
In the short term, what will make stocks go up and down is not fundamental analysis. It's not the earnings per share metrics or a return on invested capital. In the short term, if you think about weeks or months, these things are much more likely to influence uh, stock price and the global market in general because it's market sentiment and we are all human with emotions. So anything can happen in the short term. What is really interesting and I, what I want to talk about is why stocks go up in the long term. Studies have shown that there is a strong correlation between earnings per share and stock price. I'm talking about the long term. So five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, basically what you do your fundamental analysis for. So if you have a long time horizon and if you think, okay, I want to invest for the next 20 years, the main metric that you have to focus on is earnings per share, I would say. Over time, if a company grows its earnings per share, its stock price will follow. So as an example, Home Depot has had a earnings per share compounded annual growth rate, so EPS Kager, since 2003. This growth has been 12% per year. And the stock price Kager since 2003 was 12% also. Another example is Berkshire Hathaway, the company of Warren Buffett, that has grown its earnings per share 12% per year for the past 20 years. And the stock price has done 11% growth per year since this period. Another example is Microsoft that has grown its earnings per share by 15% per year since 2003. And the stock price has done 14% per year. So very similar. And finally, Walmart, you have 5% EPS, 5% stock price. The correlation is huge. And for a lot of companies over a long period of time, you have a lot of similarities between earnings per share growth and stock price growth. But I'm talking not about three years, four years. I'm talking about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. That's why it's very important to think about per share metrics because you would not have the same results in the past table if we talked about earnings and compared earnings with stock price. No, no, you have to think about earnings per share. A commonly tool to do the valuation of a stock is based on earnings per share, is based on EPS. This is called the PE ratio. You take the share price and you divide it by the earnings per share. This is maybe the most common valuation tool that you will find in the stock market. This is called the PE ratio. And it's quite important if you start investing in the stock market. Over the last 150 years, the average PE ratio of the S&P 500 has been 15. As a reminder, the S&P 500 is the basket of the leading 500 best American public companies. So that's a basket of America, basically. And the valuation over the past 150 years has been 15 PE ratio on average. In this chart, you see the evolution of the PE ratio over time, the PE ratio of the S&P 500. And you see in the past century that it has fluctuated between 5 and 25. And since 2000, with interest rates being lower than usual, with these different economic policy, globalization, you have to pay a higher price to invest in the S&P 500. It means that the PE ratio of the S&P 500 has increased since 2000. You can see some bubbles in 2000. That's the dot-com bubble when everybody uh, did a bet on technological advanced and they invested in technological companies, dot-com companies. And instead of having an average P ratio of 15, some companies, including the best companies in the world like Microsoft, they had a PE ratio of 50, 60, sometimes 70. And these led to the average to move up for the whole S&P 500. And then the bubble popped and it decreased substantially. And you have these big crises. You see a big spike in 2008 where 
the earnings were so bad and the valuation were so high that this metric is completely false and to the moon, as we say. And then you have a comeback to reality with the P at 15 and then it goes up 20, 25 and you are on average at 27 at the moment. So yeah, quite expensive at the moment, I would say. And if you compare different indices in the world, well, some markets are cheaper than the S&P 500 because market sentiment, economic data, for ex take for example, China, which has its own index and it represents the best, the leading Chinese companies. And instead of having a PE ratio of 27, you have a PE ratio of 10, I would say, in this market. And you have some Indian markets also really expensive. You have some markets in Europe that are very expensive, other that are cheap. But uh, the thing that you have to remember is that on average, over 150 years, the PE ratio of the S&P 500 has been 15. What you can do as a shortcut to valuation, and if you don't want to lose much time evaluating a business, you can say that on average, if a PE ratio is below 15 compared to average, it is most likely cheap. On average, if a PE ratio, on average, if a stock has a PE ratio at 15, it is most likely fairly valued. On average, if a stock has a PE ratio over 15, it is most likely expensive. But it depends on the situation. Sometimes a bad business can have extraordinary earnings for one year, so its P ratio can go to three. So you may think, oh, that's extremely cheap. I have a deal. And after this extremely good year, the business will come back to its poor earnings. So it was not a deal and don't fall into this trap. Most of the time, it's an extraordinary situation or it's because the business is so bad that nobody wants it. You can have these situations where businesses are so bad and there is no growth and only bad capital allocation decisions and you have a PE ratio of six and nobody wants to touch the stock. It happens a lot. And if the PE ratio is very low like this, like three, it's sometimes for a reason or temporary reason is tricky. And most of the time it's a trap. So don't fall into this trap. You don't be fooled by an extremely low PE ratio that indicates cheapness. Yes, but be sure that you invest in a stock for the good reasons and not be lured by cheap valuation. The PE ratio is seen as a comparative tool when considering companies in the same sector. If you look at two companies, you like them, you compared their financials and you like them a lot and you don't know what can differentiate them. Well, valuation can be a tool to make your choice. You can compare the current PE ratio of a company with its historical average or compare it with competitors. So you can compare two stocks in the same industry and buy the cheaper one. That could be a strategy. And you can also say that a stock is cheap compared to its own history. For example, if a company has been trading at an expensive price with a PE ratio at 60, 60 for 10 years, and then for some reason the stock price drops and the PE ratio is 15, you may say, oh, it's four times cheaper, I uh, have a deal here, but on an absolute basis, the PE ratio is 15. So it's about the average of the S&P 500 over the last 150 years. So on a relative basis, this is cheap, but on an absolute basis, it's 15. So you can say it's fairly valued. It's about the average of the S&P 500 over the last 150 years. So it's not a crazy deal. And some people do this in a extreme measure. They only invest in companies that were extremely expensive in the past. For example, you take a stock with a PE ratio over the past 10 years, the PE ratio has been 100. And then for some reason, the PE ratio dropped to 20. So you may say it's five times cheaper than average. I have a deal here, but on an absolute basis, the PE ratio is 20. It's not a crazy deal. It's above the historical average of the S&P 500. It's above the average of 15. 
So it's not a crazy good deal, but uh, the PE ratio is a great tool to compare this. And you can argue that PE ratio is linked a lot to sentiment of a company. If there is some drama, there is some crisis in a company, everybody will sell out of the stock and the stock price will drop and you have a PE ratio that will drop also. And if the crisis turns out to be temporary and may only last one year, well, one year from this crash, the stock price will recover and the PE ratio will recover and go back to historical average. So the, the PE ratio is a great tool to analyze the valuation of businesses, but it's not the only metric you can look at. There are many other valuation methods and I will show you some of them, the most important ones. Instead of having the price to earnings ratio, the PE ratio, you have the price to sales ratio, the PS ratio. You take the stock price and you divide it by sales. Another ratio is the EV on EBIT. It is a ratio that is calculated by dividing enterprise value by EBIT. You know EBIT, it's operating income. And the enterprise value is market capitalization. So the size of the company in the stock market, you add back the debt and you subtract the cash. So the enterprise value is similar to the market cap, market capitalization, but there is a small change. It's the cash situation, debt situation. If you have a company with a lot of debt, well, you have a bigger enterprise value compared to the market cap. On the contrary, you have a company with a lot of cash and no debt, well, the enterprise value will be lower than the market capitalization. So having the enterprise value instead of the market cap makes a stock a better deal. If it is very healthy with a lot of cash, you have a lower denominator and a cheaper ratio. And if the company has a lot of debt burden and it's in bad shape with a lot of debt, well, the enterprise value is bigger and your valuation ratio will be higher. So it is more expensive. So you know the price earnings ratio, stock price divided by earnings per share. The opposite of this is the earnings yield. Just take the formula and turn it upside down. You have earnings per share divided by stock price. And instead of having a number like a PE ratio of 20, you have a percentage. You have instead of 20, you make one divided by 20, you have 5%. If you have a PE of 25, you take one divided by 25, earnings yield of 4%. So some people, instead of talking about price earnings ratios and numbers, they only talk about earnings yield. That's a way of assuming if you have a 5% earnings yield, well, you can have, you can earn 5% on your investment. And the cheaper the price earnings ratio, the better the earnings yield and the better the yield of your investment. If you have a PE ratio of five, that means you have an earnings yield of 20%. And some people may argue you can have 20% return on your stock. But again, don't fall into the traps of only investing when earnings yield are above 20%, 30%, because it's most likely that you will invest in bad companies and that's a trap. Also, there is the price forward earnings ratio. It's a metric that shows you the stock price compared to the company's EPS for the next 12 months. For example, if you take a company with a PE ratio of 15 and the company says, guys, we will have a tremendous year next year. This will be enormous and we will double our earnings. So you can anticipate the PE ratio for next year. And if you have a PE ratio of 20, they say they will double earnings. So your denominator in your formula will double. So instead of having a PE ratio of 20, you have a PE ratio of 10 for next year. So you can say, okay, it was, it was quite expensive this year, but uh, if you take into account the future, it's cheap, it's a deal. So I will buy it for this reason. The formula is stock price divided by expected earnings per share for next year. Some people 
can have a forward earnings for next year, but also for the year after and the year after. And it goes into forecasts like this. You can have a PE ratio for five years in a row. Just stay with the normal PE ratio. And if you're curious and want to anticipate some earnings, want to think about how management thinks about the future, you see the price forward earnings ratio. If you go too far into the future and look into three year earnings, that's irrelevant. That's too far in the future. Another measure for valuation is price to cash flow. Instead of having a price to sales, a price to earnings, you have a price to cash flow. So you have a stock price and you divide it by operating cash flow. Another metric which is very similar and maybe more useful is to price to free cash flow. So you take the stock price and divide it by the free cash flow. As a reminder, the free cash flow is operating cash flow from your cash flow statement minus capital expenditures. And the opposite of the price to free cash flow is the free cash flow yield. The same way we had a similarity between PE ratio and earnings yield, you have it with price to free cash flow and free cash flow yield. So you just take the free cash flow per share and divide it by stock price. And the final valuation tool that we will see today is the PEG ratio, the price of a company relative to its earnings while taking into account growth. You take the PE ratio, you divide it by earnings growth, and you have a specific ratio that can be one, two, or minus than one. If you have a PEG ratio which is less than one, it means that it's cheap. And if you have something above one, well, that can be expensive, but that's not the main ones. The main ones, I would say, is P ratio, price to free cash flow, and EV EBIT. That's the three metrics I use a lot to determine if you have some valuation problems and to see if a stock is a deal or not. That's the main ones, I would say. The other valuation tool that you have to know is the discounted cash flow, the DCF. It's a valuation method that estimates the value of an investment using its expected future cash flows. You anticipate and you do a forecast of the cash flow that a company will produce next year, but the year after this and the year after this and for five years in a row, 10 years in a row. So you say, okay, you anticipate that Microsoft is going to grow its cash flow for 10% for 10 years. Okay, so th there is a formula for that. And then you discount the numbers and you have a formula. You don't have to do it yourself on Excel. You can just download some templates or use the method I will show you. It's automatic and you just put the numbers like you think Microsoft is going to grow 5%, 10% and they show you the valuation and the expected stock price, like the fair valuation. I will show you how it works later. The pros of this method of discounted cash flow model is that it's very easy to do. In a few seconds, less than one minute, you can estimate the fair value of a stock, which is really useful. Unlike comparable valuation tools, it's not influenced by non-economic or temporary factors. For example, for some events, the stock price can drop. We've seen this in the pandemic in 2020 and stock prices dropped 30%, 50%, which influence the PE ratios of these stock. So if a stock drops 50%, you have a PE ratio that drops 50%. Instead, the discounted cash flow models doesn't take into account the stock price. So if there is a crisis or a temporary problem, discounted cash flow model will not be impacted by this. So that's an advantage of using it. The cons of this method is mostly that it's based on projections of future cash flows, which is very difficult. It's very difficult to estimate the growth rates of Microsoft over the next three years. So it's even more difficult to anticipate the growth rate over five years or 10 years. It's almost impossible and nobody knows what the growth rate will be over five years or 10 years. Maybe you can anticipate over one, two, three years, but after that, it's just uh, you flip a coin and you see what you have. 
So that's why the discounted cash flow model can work. Okay. But after three years of forecasts, that's just uh, guessing what the growth rate will look like. And the trap, if you are a beginner, is to say, okay, the business has grown 15% in the past two years. I expect it to grow 15% for the next two years and for the next five years after this. So in your DCF model, you put a growth rate of 15% and it's very likely that this will not be reality. You will have competitors that will eat their lunch. You will have some problems about margins of problem about cash flows. Having achieved 15% of growth in the past two years doesn't indicate that you will grow 15% for five years, 10 years. So my advice is to be very conservative with the numbers when you use a DCF and don't anticipate something very shiny because you will get disappointed really fast. And to understand how the discounted cash flow model works, you have several steps to do the model. You first have to understand the business. Okay, what will be the margins next year, in two years? What will be the cash flow? Have management said that they will invest a lot of their cash flow to a big plant in Texas. So there will not be any cash flow for next year or two years because they will reinvest everything. What did they do? Do they have big plans or do they want to gather cash to pay down debt? You have to understand the key metrics of business and how the business works. Once you have your assumptions, you can gather historical cash flows and the growth of these cash flows in the past. After that, you can project future cash flows. That's where the hard part is, because as I told you before, it's very difficult. You don't know if it will grow 3%, 5%, 6%, 10%. It's very hard and you have to be conservative with these numbers. Also, with this model, it will calculate the terminal value and it will discount the cash flows. And at the end of this DCF model, you will have a fair price of, okay, at this price, it's good to buy the stock. At this price, the stock is cheap. That's very easy to do. And that's why a lot of people like having a DCF model. This is an example of discounted cash flow model. I've taken this screenshot from a website called Stock Unlock, which I like a lot and I use regularly. And I like their DCF model because it's really simple. And for example, now I have Google. At the right part of the screenshot, you have the metric that you want to project over five years, three years, 10 years. I've chosen free cash flow, which I think is the most important thing for Google. You can choose the number of years to project. That can be three years, five years, 10 years. I've chosen five years and you have a metric growth rate that you can choose. For just this example, I've put 15% here. You can also indicate the shares outstanding growth rate. So if you have a buyback, you have a minus 1%, minus 2%. This is the share count decreasing over time. Or if the company issues more share, you will have a positive number. If they increase their share count 1% per year, you put 1%. For Google, I said 0%, zero buyback, zero share issuance. And at the end of the five year period, you can say, okay, at the end of this five year period, what's the PE ratio? And I said, okay, this will be 25, higher than average because it's a very good business and it deserve a premium. You can have plenty of arguments to say it's worth a PE of 25. After that, you indicate the discount rate. The most basic one is 10%. It's what Warren Buffett uses, and that's your minimal rate of return that you would accept. It does the formula. It does everything, and it estimates the fair value of the business. You have a chart. You have a red line, which is the DCF fair value price. And at the bottom of this screenshot, you have the stock price, which is currently $140. The estimated fair value, thanks to this DCF model, which is $174. The model thinks that the stock is cheap. 
undervalued and it has potential. Also, the model estimates the future stock price over the next five years. And they think if Google continues to grow at 15%, in five years, the stock will be worth $281, which is a CAG compounded annual growth rate of about 15%. So that's the kind of model you have on Stock Unlock, a DCF calculator, which is really useful if you want to do some projections and estimate the future cash flow. Let's do a quick break to see some takeaways from what we've seen. We've studied capital allocation, which is the most important task of management. What is their focus? M&A, debt repayment, or a return to capital to shareholders? That's really important and you have to know how capital allocation works and you have to be critical of capital allocation decisions. You want to invest in companies that are good at capital allocation and this is really important. Another thing that we've studied is that stocks go up if earnings per share go up in the long term. If the company increases EPS, earnings per share, the stock will eventually follow. In the short term, anything can happen. The company can increase EPS and the stock price can stay flat or decrease the stock price. But in the long term, I'm talking about 10 years, 15 years, eventually the stock price will follow. It's very important. That's why you have to think about the long term, about your long term mindset. And that's why you are here. You want to plan to retire early and have some financial freedom. And if you do these things right, you can get rich and build wealth over time. The next thing that we've seen is valuation that can be calculated with many metrics. The goal is to have a rough idea of whether a stock is cheap or expensive, whether you are using comparative valuation tools like the P ratio or price to free cash flow, or if you're using a DCF model of projections of future cash flow, the goal is to have a rough idea. It is in overall cheap or in overall expensive or in overall fairly valued. You don't need precise numbers to do this. Just have a rough idea of, okay, is this a deal or not? Now let's talk about circle of competence, which is really, really important. And Warren Buffett highlighted this a lot. The goal of the circle of competence is to understand that you don't want to invest in companies you don't understand. The circle of competence has three parts. What you know, what you think you know, and what you don't know. And you accept that you don't know. For the first part, the circle of competence, what you know, is where you have your core expertise, where you are 100% sure that you are an expert and you know your stuff. If you've been working with tables, wood tables for 20 years, you're an expert in wood tables. And the best situation for you is to invest in companies in the stock market that build and sell wood tables because you have an edge, you know everything about them, you know what to monitor, what type of wood do they need, what's the best margin for this table. That's where you will be an expert, that's where you are an expert. And that's where you can make a lot of money if you stay inside your circle of competence and only invest in companies that you know really well in an industry you know really well another part of this circle of competence is what you think you know which is the most dangerous one if you have seen some documentaries maybe 10 documentaries on the rockets and you want to invest in a rocket company because you think it's cool and it's the future well don't forget that you've sold wood tables all your life and you don't know enough to be an investor shareholder of a rocket company it's really really hard to see the distinction between okay you're capable in this domain and you're not capable in this domain it's very hard but you have to be aware of what you know and what you don't know and this distinction is really dangerous because sometimes you think you know enough and there is a trap and some things that you have not seen happen and you lose all your money in a rocket bet that uh, you thought was good, but uh, you're not an expert and you missed completely an event. So you can lose your money if you don't invest 
in companies you know really well. The last part of this slide is what you don't know and accept that you don't know. I'm not a rocket expert, so I will never invest in a rocket company. As simple as that. I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. That's it. That's it. That's done. I don't want to compete with Elon Musk in this subject. I will not spend any minute analyzing a rocket company, even if it's crazily cheap. No, I'm just staying inside my circle of competence and I will spend my time otherwise. And it doesn't matter how big or small your circle of competence is. What matters is that you don't cross the boundary. If you're an expert in a particular industry, in a particular sector, just invest in this sector. That's even better for you to stay inside the industry you know well because you have an edge. You are better than most people in this industry. If you've been playing video games for the past 15 years and you've spent hours and hours playing games, you know gaming really well and you know how a game will work or not. You have the user experience, you know how the bugs are fixed, you know where customers will complain, you know the products really well and you have a really good edge in investing in video game companies. That's crazily good and people underestimate this circle of competence. They think that you only have to invest in global trends, in artificial intelligence, in rockets. Well, if you are an expert in video games, you can make a lot of money investing in gaming companies. You can make a lot of money. You just have to know yourself and you have to know your boundary so that you stay inside your circle of competence. Now let's talk about economic moat. Let's talk about competitive advantages. The economic moat is the company's ability to maintain its competitive edge over its competitors' rivals, enabling it to charge a premium without the risk of losing business, generate superior profits, and fend off competition. Well, that's the example of the Louis Vuitton bag that can raise prices and people will still buy it. This is an example of an advantage that Louis Vuitton has over some competitors that are less luxury and typical bags. If they raise prices by 50%, customers will never buy again this bag. That's end of story. You can have different kinds of modes, different kinds of competitive advantages. You can have a brand mode. So companies differentiate themselves and build customer loyalty through strong brand power. For example, Coca-Cola has a strong brand that everybody knows. If you hesitate between a Coke at a restaurant and another drink that you don't know well, well, you will take the Coke from Coca-Cola. But you have other modes, other competitive advantages like the secret mode, toll bridge mode, switching mode, price mode. And I will explain to you in simple terms how everything works. If you go from the beginning, you start from the beginning. Capitalism works, how it works. High profits attract competition. So if you have a business that generates 20% profits, 30% profits, well, other small companies will look at these profits and say, I want my share. So they come into the industry and compete with the big profitable business. So there is a competition in prices, in products, and over time, all these good margins, all these good return on capital, it all averages out. On overall, I would say that the margins will decrease, the profits, overall profits will decrease, return on capital will decrease. A small minority of companies enjoy many years of high returns of capital. How? By creating structural competitive advantages or economic modes. Some companies are so good that they remain very profitable and they shine because they have a competitive advantage. They have a business model which is differentiated from other companies and it allows them to shine. And it's important to understand why modes matter, especially in investing. An extended period of excess return on invested capital increases business value by lengthening the period during which capital can be reinvested 
at high NPV. NPV is net present value. The thing that you have to understand is if you have a wide moat, a strong moat, a strong competitive advantage, you will benefit from high return on invested capital for a long period of time. And at the right of this chart, you see that if you have no moat, competition will come and you will not enjoy your high return on invested capital for a long time. So having a moat ensures that you benefit from high returns for a long time. And I'm talking about economic moats right now because it will be important later in the valuation. Because if you think about valuation, if you think the average is a P ratio of 15, well, every business is not worth a PE of 15. If the business is superior to overall businesses, if they have a tremendous return on invested capital, tremendous margins, extremely good management, maybe they deserve a premium. And if you don't pay a PE of 15, maybe you will pay a premium of a PE of 20. Maybe if this is a great business and with the great management, you will pay a PE of 25 and it can go up and up. And for some businesses, investors can say, I'm buying this business at a PE of 35, 40, because I think with the quality of management and the competitive advantages that this company has and the long runway, I am think I'm going to be rich with the stock. I think it's not expensive with a PE of 35. So yeah, if a business has a strong moat, maybe you can pay a premium. And if you look at the other side of the coin, if a business has no moat, no competitive advantage, and even is at a disadvantage in this industry, you certainly don't want to pay a premium. You certainly don't want to pay a fair price. You want a discount. So that's why I'm talking about economic moat right now. And I will go through some examples of how competitive advantages work so you can identify them and see if it's worth paying a premium for this business and the P of 20, 25 instead of the average of 15. You have different types of competitive advantages. For example, you have intangible assets with brands, patents, licenses, but also switching costs, network effects and cost advantages. Let's go through the intangible assets. You can have a brand, for example, a lower search cost. You are known to be lower cost than competition. So people will go to you and you have developed a recognition of cheapness for your project that works for building a brand. You are the cheapest of your competitor. So people will buy you. You can create positional value like Rolex, or Cartier, or LVMH, the Louis Vuitton bags, you are so different than competition that they don't compete with you or the companies will not compete with you. You just can raise your price and people you will buy your product because people like Rolex. People like buying Louis Vuitton bag and having a Louis Vuitton bag. The feeling of wearing a Rolex is different from the feeling of wearing another watch. That's a positional value which is really specific to a certain kind of companies. Also, some brands confer legitimacy like Moody's, the rating agency, which is really, really famous. But you have also other companies that over the years have created a reputation with a lot of good track record and everybody knows them. So it's easier to use their products. That's how brands work. You can also use patents to have a moat. You can have legal monopolies, for example, arm holdings or the pharma industry. For example, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you develop a drug which is really good against, uh, I don't know, obesity and you have a patent for this, well, nobody can touch your product. And for, I don't know, the patent is maybe eight years, nobody can harm you for eight years, your product will not have competition over eight years. The thing is that after eight years, well, you, you have a war with competition for these products, but it can give you a temporary edge over competition if you have a um, legal monopoly with a patent. 
And you can also have intangible assets with licenses and approvals that will give you an advantage over competition. Another moat is the high switching cost. It costs more for user to switch to competitors than it does to remain with incumbent. And the cost of customers leaving you for a competitor can have many forms. It can be money, like the subscription of uh, the business, but also time, because for example, if you change a business and if you're a customer of a business, you want to change the company because another company provides better value, well, you have to take all your data from the first company, analyze it, and then use all your data, condense it, and give them to the second company. It takes a lot of time to collect your data, analyze them. It's much more simple to stay with the first company. If you have your data in the first company, it's just not worth it to change your mind and change everything, change all your data. It's just too complex. So the high switching cost can be money, time, and also risk. For example, if you want to change your provider of something, you have to collect all your data and give your data to a competitor, which may provide more value, but there is a risk of losing your data along the way of this long process. And maybe you don't know the second company really well, you don't know how it works. People are very wary of changing their minds. It's much more comfortable to stay with your first service provider. Even if it costs more money, a lot of people will say it's not worth it to change and I will just stay with the provider I have. So these costs can be explicit, like the price, for example, or implicit, time and risk. So the high switching cost is a very powerful economic moat. There are some examples like projects that are tightly integrated with customer business processes for Oracle, SimCorp or Autodesk, but also products with high benefit cost ratios like Amazon or Moody's, for example. For Amazon, it's just very, very easy to order a product from Amazon with a very good price and in one or two days it will be here uh, at your house versus going to another website that may provide more value but it's just less comfortable you don't know the website really well you don't trust it it will cost you some time to register into this new website you don't know how it works no it's just easier to order everything you want through amazon which is a wonderful switching cost example another competitive advantage which is really powerful is network effects the companies with network effects, they provide a product or service that increases in value as the number of users expands, like Visa, Rightmove, but can also work with Facebook, like meta platforms. Because for example, if for Facebook, you only had 10 customers, well, the website would be quite useless. But now that we are billions of users, in Facebook, well, the amount of interaction between users, the amount of content provides a lot more value to each other. So that's a beautiful network effect. These network effects are maintained by subsidizing one side of the network, like Adobe or Uber, but also driving engagement like Facebook. You want to keep your customers satisfied. You want to keep them happy. So you want to have high engagement so that your customer will use your product again and again and again. And they all contribute to the network effect. Network effects are at risk if the pricing power is abused, like for Bloomberg, or if the user experience degrades. Nobody uses MySpace anymore. They want it to be more profitable with more ads in the feed and the user experience was really, really bad. And getting poorer and poorer. So everybody left MySpace to go to Facebook and Instagram and other social media companies. So yeah, these network effects are really strong. They work really well, but you have to do things well. You have to monitor your customer experience really well and provide a lot of value with your network. And then we have cost advantages. The process is that 
you create a cheaper way to deliver a product that can't be replicated easily. So you have some Geico, for example, providing insurance cheaper than anyone else. And it's very hard to compete in this industry and the barrier to entry are really high. So small companies won't have the courage to go in the industry to compete with extremely low prices. That's also a method used in airlines, with airlines that you have low prices, low ticket prices. So it's really, really hard for a small, small company to come in this industry because it's just too hard to, to compete. And scale is important here because you can spread fixed cost over a large base. Relative size matters more than absolute size. For example, Costco or Amazon. They are so big that fixed costs are spread over all their operations. And if a small company wants to compete with Amazon, their fixed cost will be so large that they will be put out of business really fast. But Amazon is so large that it can take this cost, this fixed cost, and continue to grow again and again. Efficiency, operational aspect of Amazon, this is great. And that's why Amazon has a beautiful competitive advantage. And some companies have a niche. They dominate industry with high minimum efficient scale relative to TAM, total addressable market, like Constellation Software. It's a Canadian business that sells software, does a lot of m and and they acquire small businesses that do software extremely well. So it's a niche market and they are extremely good at what they're doing. So that constitutes a cost advantage and a very strong moat around their business. But you have to understand what's not a moat. For example, a dominant market share is not a moat. It's not because you have a high market share, a 40% market share, then you have a moat. It's just that you are bigger, but competition can eat you years after years and your big market share can collapse in a few years. Also, technology is not a moat. Things can go really fast. Commoditization and disruption are inevitable absent customer lock-in. So GoPro at the time, what they did with cameras, this was amazing. And then we've seen a lot of competitors with the same cameras and you will have the same results. And some cameras are cheaper than GoPro. So I would say that GoPro has no moat at all. We just have some brand recognition, but that will not force me to buy a GoPro camera if I have seen a competitor selling a similar product 20% cheaper. Having hot products is not having a competitive advantage. If you have hot products with some hype, they can generate high returns for a short period of time, but sustainable returns make a moat. If this is only short term, this is not a moat. You don't have moats for two or three years. You just have a temporary advantage. When you talk about a moat, you talk about a 10 year track record of high return on invested capital, high advantage over competition. If it's just some good products over two or three years, this is not a moat. Moats are always moving. They are never stable. Either the moat widens over time or it shrinks over time. But management always have to keep improving their products, improving their performance, improving the company overall because competition is always here. And if you are lazy and comfortable as a big profitable company, competition will come for you. So the big question is what will widen the company's moat? And this answer should drive management strategy. You can do like Amazon and improve the customer experience year after year. This was their drive, their focus to each year have a customer who is very happy. You want to improve the customer experience year over year for Amazon and for years and years and decades. And it has worked beautifully for Amazon. 
Another example is Costco with scale economies shared. It's a virtuous cycle of having cheap prices, which leads to more clients, which means that you have to buy more products from your supplier. And because it's all fixed cost, well, you can reduce your buying cost from your supplier and the client will be happy, get cheaper price, client happy, cheaper price. And that's a virtuous cycle that works really well. You also have Uber with the increased vehicle liquidity or Holden joinery that solve a builder's problems and Facebook that drive user engagement. You have several tactics that management use to widen the moat so that competitors are away from them and they can thrive from high margins, high return on invested capital. If they have an edge, you have to feed this edge. You have to increase the gap between you and your competitor. So that's a big question. And if you don't put efforts, if a management doesn't put efforts into this, into widening the moat, well, the moat will shrink and competitors will come for you. So capital allocation is the link between business value and shareholder value. As we've seen, if capital is deployed in ways that destroy value, shareholders do not fully benefit from increased business value. If you do stupid things, value is vaporized. So it's really important for management. If capital is deployed in ways that amplify value, shareholders will benefit from both increased business value and from value accretive actions. So value compounds. If you do good capital allocation, it compounds and it creates value. If you do bad capital allocation that destroys your competitive advantage, you destroy value. And that's not what you want for your business. So that's, again, some examples of different competitive advantages. You can have no moat, no competitive advantage. You can have a narrow moat, so a small competitive advantage that is sufficient, that is enough to be differentiated from competition, but it's not that big. And you have wide moats where it's just enormous when the moat is enormous. For example, Coca-Cola, it's very hard to disrupt this industry because Coca-Cola has been here for centuries and everybody knows the name of Coca-Cola. They want to Coke, they know. It's just sugar water but consumers pay a premium. They don't care if the price is a bit more expensive, they want the Coke. And there are a lot of other businesses that have wide moats and take advantage of this. Every business wants a wide moat and you have to put the efforts to get to this situation. So to sum up about modes, that was just some simple terms and simple analysis of the different competitive advantages that exist, but there are more. And in future modules inside the school community, we will go through every competitive advantage and analyze them with specific examples. I think you will learn a lot and we will see how a company can lose its competitive advantage by doing stupid things with real examples that happen in real life and that happens. Everybody is a human, you can do mistakes and if you do two or three or four mistakes in a row, you can lose your competitive advantage. And if you own this stock of this company that does stupid things, if you own this stock in your portfolio, you have to monitor these changes before your investment goes bad because it can go bad really quick. And if you don't monitor specific metrics, specific ratios to understand bad capital allocation, it can go bad really fast. So you have some things that you have to monitor. So I encourage you to join the school community now. There is a link in the description. So let's use everything we learned to find great stocks. That's why you are here. You want to build a strong portfolio with strong companies. And with key metrics, you can filter out bad companies to only stay with the great companies. For example, you can only filter revenue growth superior to 7%. You don't want revenue growth, which is negative. You don't want a business that is shrinking. You want a business that is growing and growing at a decent rate. You want earnings growth at more than 9%. For example, it is more than revenue. And it means that the business is getting more and more efficient. 
you want some return on investment superior to 15%, which is very good. Some good profit margins, about 10%. And you want the net debt on free cash flow to be under three. So basically a business that generates a lot of cash and is growing consistently at a decent rate. There are several steps to find great stocks and compounding quality provide six steps. For example, you can start with studying the competitive advantage of a business. You don't want to invest in the next big thing. You want to invest in companies that have already won and they will keep winning. And they do that by having a moat, a good competitive advantage that will deter competition from coming and compete with them. So to determine a good competitive advantage, you have several metrics, including having a high gross margins, above 40%, which means that you have pricing power and you can increase your price without losing customers. Think about the Louis Vuitton bag that you can increase the price of the bag and people will still buy it. And another metric to see if a business has a moat is a high return on investing capital above 15%, above 20, 25%. You can also look for companies with skin in the game. So management with high ownership. If the CEO has 10% of the shares, he or she has skin in the game. The business must also have low capital intensity. It depends on the situation, but asset light businesses can provide more value with better return on invested capital. So that's a easier way to invest. Companies that require very little capital to operate are very attractive for investors. So you compare capex to sales below 5%. That's a metric, but we will see other metrics. The next step to find great stocks is to define what a good capital allocator is and to only look for great capital allocation. So with, again, high return on invested capital, high return on capital employed, and some other qualitative aspect of managing a business for the long term. You need a business with high profitability. You want to invest in companies that translate most revenue into earnings. So we've seen high gross margins at the beginning, but also high profit margins and high free cash flow margins. And you want a secular trend. In the long term, stock prices tend to follow earnings growth. So earnings growth above 5% and EPS growth above 7%. That's a bit conservative. You can reach for more than 7%. You can reach for 10%, 20%. But let's stay conservative and say 7% at the beginning. You can put whatever number you want, but it's much more likely that a growth at 7% is sustainable compared to a growth at 30% per year for a decade. It's almost impossible to grow 30% for a decade. But 7% per year of earnings it is sustainable. You want a secular trend which is positive and you don't want at all a bad secular trend. If this is a bad industry that is dying with very low growth and negative growth, the revenue is negatively impacted by the secular trend. So less revenue, less earnings. You don't want, you don't want to invest in these companies. And you have different reasons to buy a stock you can first see the price and invest when the stock is undervalued. The cheaper you can buy your stock, the higher your margin of safety. Margin of safety is, for example, you define that the fair value of a stock is $100 and you don't want to buy it at $100. You want a margin of safety and you want to buy it at an even cheaper price. So if you think that this business, this stock is worth $100, you will buy it at $70. So you have a margin of safety. Compare a company's DCF yield with its average free cash flow yield over the past five years to get the first indication about valuation. Yes, as I said previously, you want to get a rough idea of valuation if it's roughly cheap or roughly expensive. Also, you can buy a stock because fundamentals are improving. Stock prices follow intrinsic value over time. When a company's profit margin doubles, its earnings also double. So you can watch for strengthening balance sheet, reduced capital intensity, improved capital allocation, enhanced profitability. If you have a change in management after bad years of capital allocation, 
the CEO quits, you have another CEO, and the company starts again to be more profitable with good capital allocation, then this could be an indication of uh, you have to buy the stock. If the stock is re reasonably priced and you understand the business and the CEO is very competent, competent and fundamentals are improving, this could be a reason to buy the stock. Another reason is that the moat is strengthening. Determining the existence and durability of a competitive advantage is key to make good investment decisions. So how to identify a moat, as I told you, high and consistent gross margin to have pricing power and high and consistent return on invested capital. If the moat widens over time, it means that this is a better business and this could be a reason to buy the stock. Also, the future could look bright for the stock. In the long term, earnings growth is the main driver for stock prices. And the longer your companies can grow their earnings at attractive rates, the better. If management guarantees you at 100% that they are going to grow their earnings at 20% per year for the next 10 years, they guarantee you 100%, first be hesitant. Okay, that's almost impossible, but just imagine this scenario. They guarantee at 100%, it's for sure. Well, even if the price is still high, a bit expensive, growing 20% per year with a huge mode, huge competitive advantage, this is amazing. And this is a buying opportunity. Even if you have a PE of 40, say 40, the business will grow 20% per year. And in 10 years, the expensive price that you would have paid in the first year would not have mattered much, would not have mattered at all. I mean, because you will have a tremendous return. And finally, a reason to buy the stock is when insiders are heavily buying. Insiders know the business really well. For example, if you have a CEO that owns 10% of the stock and the stock price for some reason, the stock get cut in half, losing 50% of its value, the CEO is buying more of the stock. He knows everything about the business and he's buying the stock. He's investing in the business. This is also a good reason for common shareholders to buy the stock. There are many reasons for management to sell their shares. They can buy a new house, pay tuition for a child, but there is only one reason why an insider buys his own stock. He thinks the stock is undervalued. Companies in which insiders are heavily buying outperform with three or 6% per year on average. And that's true. And there are some specific elements that work better than average. And that's what we will see now. Some elements in the long term work better. So if you identify these elements, you increase the odds of you making a lot of money in the stock market and picking great stocks. For example, size matters. In general, small companies outperform the big companies because it's easier for them to get more efficient, to get more lean, and the stock performance of small and medium-sized businesses in the stock market in general, they perform better than big, large businesses. Also, you can increase the odds of having a good return in the stock market if you buy when it's cheap. It's logical. The cheaper you buy, the better. Also, high dividend stocks do not outperform in general. The companies that pay a lot of dividends generally are large and not growing fast. And if you think about... Uh, 10 years horizon, 20 years, well, you want companies that grow their earnings and companies with high dividend yields, they don't grow much. Free cash flow is king. That's very true. It's even better than to compare earnings. You want to compare free cash flow and you want to see if free cash flow is growing over time. So companies that generate a lot of free cash flow generally perform better in the stock market. And the healthier balance sheet, the better. Companies that have a lot of debt, well, they have a burden and compared to a company that don't have debt at all and they have a lot of cash, well, I would 100% go and invest with companies that have a lot of cash. 
Don't look at profit margins alone. Investing in companies with high profit margins does not work if the company doesn't have a competitive advantage. When a company has a high profit margin but no moat, rivals will enter the market and reversion to the mean takes place. You can't have a moat, a competitive advantage, for only two to three years. You need sustainable, 10 years in a row, very high margins, very high return on invested capital, and you want to widen the moat over time. So if you look at a specific year with high margins, you can't say if this is a good business or not. You can't say if this is a company with a competitive advantage or not. Also, return on equity is important. It's a good metric. When you would have bought the stocks with the highest ROE, you would have slightly outperformed the market. However, in general, it is a very good idea to combine good capital allocation metrics with a high profitability. If you combine a great manager, a great capital allocator, great management, with a very strong business model, with a very strong profitable business model, well, you have a secret sauce to generate very high returns in stocks. Also, momentum works great. And in the short term, you can take advantage of this phenomenon. In the short term, things that go down continue to go down and things that go up continue to go up. You can take advantage of this to buy at a cheaper price. If a stock goes down and will continue to go down in the short term, you can just wait for the good opportunity if you want to buy the stock. And with that, you can combine momentum and value. Combining momentum and value achieved an annual return of 21% per year between 1964 and 2009. This is an annual outperformance of 10% per year compared to global indices. So you can combine some elements here to outperform the market and consistency is key. By definition, every active strategy will underperform the market from time to time. Discipline and consistency are key. Keep faith to your strategy and you will end up fine. Investing is a marathon, not a sprint. It's very important. Don't be in a hurry. You have time to invest. And if you're patient and if you have discipline, you will reach your financial freedom. You will grow your wealth. If you do things right and you build a strong portfolio, you will do very well. And now let's see the complete idea generation process. With everything you've learned, all the metrics you've learned, capital allocation decisions, how to identify a moat, etc., you can generate ideas now. And I have this chart here that will sum up what we will do next. So you have your investable universe. You have all the stocks that you can invest in, tens of thousands of stocks. You will never have the time to analyze them all. You have to select some criteria and analyze some of them. And to do that, you can only look at companies that you understand so that you stay within your circle of competence. Do you understand how the company makes money? Only invest in what you understand. So out of the tens of thousands of companies, you can remove a lot of them to keep only the companies you understand. It doesn't matter if you only understand 50 companies or 100 companies or a thousand companies. The thing is to only invest in what you know. So even if you understand 15 companies really well, well, that can be 15 potential investment ideas. So it doesn't matter how many companies you understand. Just the important part is to stay outside of companies that you don't understand. And now with the remaining list, buy wonderful companies. You just look for companies with a sustainable competitive advantage, a healthy balance sheet, low capital intensity, great capital allocation skills, high profitability, and plenty of reinvestment opportunities. You can have several metrics to identify how wonderful a company is, like revenue growth, earnings growth, high return on invested capital, high margins, having low debt, generating a lot of cash. And after the ratios, the metrics are good, you want to do the qualitative stuff. Invest in companies where your interests are aligned with the one of management, insider ownership. Companies with skin in the game outperform the market by a wide margin. So you can ask some questions like, is the company still led by its founder or 
Is insider ownership superior to 10%? How long has the CEO been working for the company? Does the company use a lot of stock-based compensation? So stock options. Does management have a great track record? So you have to look at past years, in the past 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, to see if managers have a good track record or not. And this is much more qualitative than quantitative. After that, you reduce your list over time. You will find bad management or bad business model. You reduce your list and you only invest in companies that are trading at a good valuation. Try to buy wonderful companies at a fair price and always use a margin of safety. You don't want to pay full price for a stock. You want to pay the best price and the cheapest price as possible. Even the best company in the world can be a bad investment if you pay too much. For example, if you had bought Microsoft in 2000, well, the valuation of Microsoft was very expensive, like very, very expensive with a PE ratio of over 60, 70. So you can buy a wonderful business model, wonderful Microsoft. It's just that the price is too high. The people who had bought Microsoft in 2000 during the dot-com bubble, they waited 16 years before getting a profit on their investment. So no returns whatsoever for 16 years. So you want to pay attention to valuation. That's very important. And finally, with the remaining stocks of your list, you build your portfolio, 15, 20 stocks, which match all criteria above. But you can only have 10 stocks if you want only eight stocks if you want. Invest in the best companies in the world, compounding machines at fair valuation levels. That's part of the game. That's the big picture of investing in the stock market with stocks. You want to build a strong portfolio filled with strong companies. And these are all the criteria you need to identify great companies. So the big summary is to understand key financial metrics to look at. You have to know yourself and define your circle of competence to only invest in businesses you really understand. You also have to analyze the competitive advantage of a business. It's really important. You have to know if a business has a moat or not, and preferably you want a wide moat for the business so it can have strong margins, strong profitability over a long period of time. And finally, you need a rough idea of valuation. I'm not asking for specific numbers, decimals, just have a rough idea. If it's roughly cheap, roughly fairly valued or roughly expensive, that's important.